Hi, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and we continue today uh, in a series in the book of Romans, which uh, is taking up uh, the fall of 2023 and going to take us right up through May of, 20, or I guess, fall of 2022, let's put it that way, uh, and right up through May of 2023. Uh, and so I want to uh, encourage you to come, uh, to come regularly, uh, to stay in the book of Romans yourself. Uh, and we're just in a passage today that's just one of those, um, I don't know what you call it, it's just one of those marquee passages that declares such great truths. Uh, I've been praying for myself and for you, uh, for us by the Spirit to get inside this truth and enjoy it, uh, to be secured by it, uh, to be uh, impelled in our obedience by it, uh, especially in the light of the crazy space we find ourselves in. Uh, in the West in 2023 uh, as we live out our lives. Uh, today is a, a day where we're remembering uh, a number of things here in our own congregation and as you're praying, uh, as God calls us, and we'll see this passage when we get to Romans chapter 12. Uh, as a family, we're called to rejoice with those who rejoice uh, and weep with those who weep. And so uh, I get to start today, I'm, I'm going to embarrass them today, but Abby and, and John... Uh, Abby Harmon and John Brads are going to begin their premarital counseling today. Uh, and my wife, pardon me? Alan, sorry. Let me get the right guy, right? I want to make sure. My, my wife is shaking her head over here, and I'm saying, what, what did I do? What did I do? All right, well, I know what I did now. I, I, I put Abby with the wrong guy. Uh, but, so, no, we, we do know who we're talking to today, just in case uh, you're wondering. Well, we're excited about that. We're excited about that journey, and we're excited about being a part of that journey. Uh, with them and some other couples that are there, uh, but also at the same time, right, uh, uh, Jerry Gorham's mom just passed away and, and they had her uh, celebration just here the other day. Um, uh, Chris and Jean lost their son, Scott, and uh, Will, who's not with us today, Pastor Will, he's out in California, is there uh, looking at the funeral of Kim's father, Woody. So it's a season of beginnings and endings uh, and uh, we want to talk about this song that we just sang is so important. Uh, we, if we were putting our hope in a given relationship or a given set of circumstances, uh, it would be a sad, sad thing. But our, faithful, our, our trust is in the faithful God who's dem demonstrated himself to be faithful. And not only a faithful God, but a God who's gone to the nth degree to love us. Uh, and so we want, to, we want to celebrate that and talk about that today. Uh, I want to keep encouraging you, and I, I know Sarah mentioned this, but I encourage you that uh, if uh, you're going to be here and be a part of our study, get, get a notebook, uh, work through uh, the book of Romans. Um, I, I find myself, one of the things that happens to people who follow Jesus for a while is we get less than deliberate when it comes to studying our Bibles. Uh, we don't write things down. We don't interact actively with what's going on. And so I want to encourage you to make use of that tool. Uh, don't be someone who just merely uh, listens to the smooth voice over Bible Gateway or UVerse, uh, but also be someone who actively engages uh, and prays through uh, the passages themselves. I, I want to encourage you that I, I really believe that Scripture teaches, and I'll pray that way this morning, Scripture teaches that we need the Spirit's enablement uh, to get inside the truths that we comprehend in Scripture. Um, and so, as I've often said to myself and, and to the people that God gives me an opportunity to talk to, we would all be different if we actually lived into and enjoyed what we know. And so, I'm praying that for us today as we think about it. So, we're in the book of Romans, and so I want to take you, because we've been on a little uh, break, right, a little hiatus over the, over the Christmas uh, break. And so, bring us back real quickly to where we should be, as soon as I turn on the, the things here. Um, so, so far, right, we began the book of Romans, a uh, very interesting book, and we've talked about Paul introduces in 1, 1 to 15 his position as an apostle to the Gentiles and his purpose, right? He's coming uh, to write to primarily, he's writing primarily to, to Gentiles, even though, of course, he's going to talk to Jews, uh, but he's coming to uh, uh, the city of Rome, uh, not as the founding pastor. Matter of fact, he'd never been there. 
uh, up to this point in time. Paul wanted to get there. Uh, he wanted to use his apostolic gifts to build them up. You can read about that in verse 11. He wanted to encourage them in their faith. And, but he also looked forward to them encouraging him because there was a lot of mature believers uh, at this church in Rome. As a matter of fact, when we get to chapter 16, we're going to see a little bit of a Hall of Fame of faith. Not only are we going to see uh, a number of people who are there, but some of the, 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 the important personalities and servants of the church in the first century are going to be mentioned there, and Paul is going to mention them and bring them to our attention. So he tells us that he's writing about this gospel, this good news that's rooted in the Old Testament, and it reminds us as he tells the story that what he's going to talk about is something that's a part of God's plan that that's goes back to creation all the way forward to this present moment. So John's, uh, Paul's argument all along is that he's not adding, uh, coming up with something new. He's just talking about what God has been intending to do all along. And of course, this is his argument as a Jew. He's come to embrace Jesus and not depart from Judaism, but he's embraced Jesus as the goal of where everything was heading. And he's trying to encourage others to do the same. Well, when we get to verses 16 and 17, we get the passage that almost all interpreters say, well, this is the theme. This is Paul's theme statement. And here he's going to talk about how one, the just, how one is righted with God. And this is the key thing that we're going to find out is that nobody is righted with God by birth. Nobody is righted with God by virtue of their efforts. Nobody is righted with God by virtue of their heritage or by virtue of their or involvement in some sort of church or religious organization or by virtue of their inherent goodness or anything like that. Well, the big question is how do we get righted with God? And we have to find out, of course, at the beginning that we're not right with God. As a matter of fact, to be on the wrong side of God is to be on the wrong side of everything. Right? Paul is going to say, when he gets to chapter 8, he's going to give praise and say, you know, thanks be to God, right? There's no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, condemnation from who? From God. And then he's going to go on to say at the end of the chapter, if God is for us, who can be against us? But the flip side is also true. If God isn't for you, it doesn't make any difference who is. Right? It doesn't make any difference how much money you have. It doesn't make any difference how much power you have. It doesn't make any difference how attractive you are. It doesn't make any difference how viral you go. You're ultimately missing everything that truly matters now and to come. Okay, so Paul's statement. So how do you get right with God? By faith. And we had that. And then what does that life look like that you are brought into? This, this change that happens to you. So he's going to explain God's program in Christ in 1 through 8. And he's going to defend it in 9 through 11. And he's going to apply it to the people of God with a particular emphasis on Jews and Gentiles and their tensions that they have that they're bringing into the church. So here's that favorite, famous verse. I hope that you memorized it or you will memorize it for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as written, the righteous will live by faith. Right, so the theme verse. Now, where we've gone so far, up in the fall, we covered chapter 118 through chapter 4, verse 25. Now, all I've given you here is that if you have your notes, this is the outline at the beginning of your study of the book of Romans, right? So it's not something for you to write down here, but if you have a, a study guide, this is laid out for you. So we talked about in chapter 1 through chapter 4, God's righteousness demonstrated an access through Christ alone, by faith alone, for everyone. Right? So that whole idea was carried forward in those first four chapters. And he began by saying that God's righteousness means condemnation for all, for all of sin. Right? That's a fundamental. Uh, the book of Romans is such a downer from 118 to 320. Right? Uh, you're bad. Yes, you're bad. Yes, you're really bad. And yes, you're super bad. And yes, you're in trouble. And you're bad. Right? I mean, that's where it goes. And that's not a popular message in the moment, especially where people want to go and they want to be affirmed. The last thing that you want to have somebody say something to you, they disagree with their self-assessment of who they are, or that you tell them that that's not good for you, or this is wrong. Right? That whole thing, that whole conversation in the culture in which we live makes you a bigot, a hater, right? arrogant, that you would have the audacity to say that there's something wrong with what I'm choosing to do that there's something wrong with me, that, that this way is right and true for everyone. 
right? that kind of thing. Well, Paul wants to say he sweeps up all the people who are non-Jews, and he sweeps up all the Jews, and he says consistently they take what they know of God, they reject it, and they try to replace it with their own way. Right? And they reject it, and they rebel against him. And the Gentiles are involved in all kinds of idolatry and sexual debauchery. The Jews just put, their, just put a religious gloss over their rebellion. But it's the same thing at the core. And so when he gets to the end, right, he gives a whole statement, a whole list of, of Scripture passages that say, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none that seeks after God. Right? And then he gives a description of the impact on the heart and soul of every person that it so uh, uh, darkens our souls that our lips become sources of poison. Right? So it's very true. But then, of course, in 321, 26, is the light that breaks into the darkness. It's Christ steps in to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. And the dilemma, of course, is that we've gotten ourselves into a mess that we can't get out of. So I can't save myself. I'm broken. I'm running away from God. So what happens? Well, God steps in in Christ to take care of what we couldn't do for ourselves. So human sin, well, who's going to take that punishment? Who's going to atone for, cover that egregious offense against the God who created them? Well, there's no human being who could bear it. So Jesus comes, right? We just celebrated his incarnation. He comes into the world to live his perfect sinless life. He goes up to die, not for his own sins, but for our sins. And so he takes God's wrath on him so that we don't have to bear it. And so that God's righteousness, his justice is protected because God doesn't act in opposition to his own character. So punishment of sin is delivered to Jesus. And so God is righteous and the one who can make righteous those who have sinned against him. Right? So the basic line that Paul wants to say, there's only two ways that you can relate to God's wrath. You can experience it personally for yourself or Jesus will experience it for you. Okay? So then we come to 327 to 31, and now it means that, well, there's no grounds for boasting. There's no grounds. No human being can stand in front of God and say, you know, God, what a good pick I am for the kingdom, right? Uh, I'm sure you like me, and I'm a great guy, a great girl. Uh, and uh, when you look out across humanity, you say, I want him on my team. Now, when he looks out across humanity, he sees rebels, sinners with lives that are, un that are broken. And God says, I'll take you in mercy. So then, in chapter 4, since faith is the way we get inside of this gift that God has given us in Christ, we better have a little bit of a, a treatment of faith in detail. And so Abraham, right, an Old Testament figure, is trotted out to give us a case study in what faith looks like. So here, before he was circumcised, Abraham was made right with God by faith in the promise, the promise what? That Christ would ultimately fulfill, and then God intended him to be the spiritual father of all who would believe. So this is why I grew up in Sunday school, all right, with a little song. Some of you have heard it, Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons. And I sang it a lot when I was younger. I did not know exactly what it meant, but I enjoyed making all of the uh, uh, motions with it, right? Uh, shaking my legs, my arms, various other things like that as I was enjoying Father Abraham having many sons. But that's the point here is that Abraham is the father in the sense that he's the one by faith who puts his trust in the promise that God has given, now we put our trust in the promise fulfilled in Jesus. Right? So we put our trust in him. Now, as we get to chapter 5, now we're going to start to explore this new life that we have now that we've been righted with God. Right? And this is one of the things here that we're going to talk about. Uh, one of my favorite psalms is, talks about, uh, it's the Myrie Clay psalm, of speaking about us being in a pit. And God reaches down and then he pulls us out and he sets us outside of the pit, right? But one of the things that we want to celebrate here is that God just doesn't, you know, grab us out of the pit and say, you know, you idiot, why did you get in the pit? You know, you really smell, you know that. And then just sets us on the side and says, okay, I, I saved your life, now get out of my sight, right? I don't have time for you. No, he picks us up out of the pit, he cleans us up, he changes us forever, and he says, I want you to be a family member. Right? That's a different thing. That's a different thing. And so now we're going to start exploring, right, this new reality that we have. And we'll begin by talking about it's a life of peace. And we'll talk about what that peace is. 
and Paul's going to introduce it in 5, 1 to 11. He's going to add some more at the end of the chapter, but that's where we are. So I've tried to title this Exploring Graceland, okay? We're going to explore Graceland, and I see people chuckling. I meant you to chuckle as a pun there, All right? This is not the Graceland in Nashville, Tennessee, or in this Memphis, I'm sorry, in Memphis. I'm getting people's names wrong and locations wrong, somewhere in the United States. Uh, in Memphis, but here, this is, it comes from the phrase in verse 2, through whom also we have been given access into this grace in which we stand. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. We're going to explore the land of grace as we look at it. Okay. Now, I don't know if you're a person that likes to explore. Uh, and I, I just want to think about this, the positive thing of what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to invite us into this wonderful new relationship that we've entered into. Okay? And, and I think this is so crucial for us. If you've been in the church for any length of time, one of the real dangers about following Christ over time is that you get bored with the landscape. Right? Uh, let me give you this one simple example. The first time Ron and I had a chance, uh, we were in Scotland. Uh, we were on a very tight budget, but we desperately wanted to go to the continent. We wanted to see Europe. Uh, and we could not afford hotels. Uh, we could, but we could afford a pup tent. And literally, that's what we had, an army pup tent. It was green uh, that somebody, one of our Scottish friends, loaned to us. And so we got on a website that, there wasn't a website at that time, it was a catalog, sorry, no website. We got on the catalog, and we started looking at this place called Eurocamp, and we said, so we'll take two nights here in Paris, and then two nights here in, uh, on the Riviera, and we'll take two nights here. And, so, and we, we stayed in camps in a pup tent, right? Uh, and it was real dry that summer in Europe uh, as we went around. But we would go all these places, and we'd have two or three days, and we had a very limited budget. I remember, particularly when we were in, uh, um, uh, oh, come on, no, no, just before Germany, we're, Switzerland. We are in Switzerland. It was so stinking expensive, we couldn't afford to eat. And so we hardly ate anything. We got to Germany, we were like little pigs, because uh, it was so cheap when we got there. But we couldn't afford hardly anything when we were there. We certainly enjoyed the scenery, but it's hard to live on scenery alone, right? In terms of that, the Alps were beautiful and those kind of things. So, uh, when we got to Paris, we wanted to see everything. We'd never been there before. I remember we got there and we were all, the first time we walked out to the city, right? It looked, you know, it wasn't really any big deal. It looked like Xenia, right? Paris did. No, no, every building was a work of art, right? It was beautiful. Statue, statues everywhere, the Arc, Tri Arc of Triumph, all these kind of things that we were looking at. I mean, it was just gorgeous. We were awed by the setting. And so we planned to go to the Louvre. All right, we planned to go to the Louvre. Uh, and we were excited about going to the Louvre. Uh, we got there, and there's the glass pyramid, you know, and you go down, you go into the Louvre, and we're excited about it. And we were the typical, uh, you know, tourists. We got this list of all the masterpieces, which is like every other painting, right, that you're going through. And we found ourselves, we'd been there for like a couple hours, and it, and it was like this. First, first painting was like, whoa. There's the Mona Lisa. We're staying there with another hundred people trying to look at it from a distance. Right, there's the Mona Lisa behind the glass case up there on the side. It's not that big. You're trying to get it. And you're so, that's the Mona Lisa. We're seeing it like up close and, and, and in person, this first one. Well, after we'd done that for about an hour, we go, oh, there's another masterpiece. Oh, there's one. Oh, man, I'm tired. You ready to go home? Right? And, and, and those, those uh, museums, we found out, they're meant, the best way to enjoy them is to go there, pick one or two things, sit there and savor it for a long time and then leave. And I think for many of us, in terms of following Christ, we've heard some of the old, old story over again and it's just an old, old story. And it doesn't awe us anymore. And it happens to us, one of the, one of the effects of the fall is to grow bored and distant from things that are rich and good. All right. So, I thought about this too. I went to Yellowstone. How many of you have been to Yellowstone? Have you been there? Right, I went there uh, as our family was getting smaller and, and our daughters were leaving us for, for stinking guys and abandoning us and our families. Uh, and we had two daughters left at home. And we went to Yellowstone with Victoria and, and Dominique. And I just remember feeling like every time I went around the corner there was something else. Right? And it's a very diverse landscape. You've got mountains up in the north. I love the Montana uh, area up in there. It's just beautiful. I could just sit there and watch the animals. I love to watch the animals. 
Uh, I remember trying to strain because they were trying to watch this uh, uh, female a wolf that had a, cub, had a set of cubs and they were trying to see, she, she's, she's on this distant hill, you know, like a mile away and the guy was looking at a telescope, right? And so I wanted to see it, all those kind of things, bison everywhere, elk, right? The, the uh, hot springs and the volcanic activity, uh, Yellowstone River in the falls, just like every time you turned the corner, it was one panorama after another. Uh, and I just wanted to stay there. And it's something that you could not absorb in the two days we spent in it, right? And so I want to invite you to explore something that's much richer, right? And I, I want to pray for us that God would do that in our own minds and souls today. So would you stand with me? And we're going to read this passage. I'm going to read it for you. But here's where we are today. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, let's begin. Let's begin right here in chapter 1. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 1. Having been justified, therefore, by faith, we have peace. What Paul wants to say, of course, this is one of those passages in verse 5 that you, have, you need to read chapters 1 through 4 to appreciate what he says. The platform that we can even begin to stand on to talk about the things we're talking about is that we've been righted with God, right? Uh, and it becomes even more wonderful, as it's going to be illustrated here, because we've learned that we were under, right? Come back to chapter 1 and verse 18, right? Chapter 1 and verse 18. This is where it all started, right? And he's going to take us back to that very idea. He's going to contrast that now we've been saved, but formerly we were under God's wrath. And it says, for verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven upon all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of human beings. Who, notice here, who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Okay? And so the issue here is that the, 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 what's happened is you had a group of people, and this is one of the things we've emphasized over and over again. In our current moment, we like to describe uh, uh, things that we struggle with as human beings or things that are happening in our lives that, that are difficult we always like to attribute them to anything else but our own choices, right? If you grew up in the screwed up family that I'm in, you'd understand why I'm so screwed up, right? If you worked with the people that I worked with, you'd understand why I've got the neuroses that I have, right? Uh, the culture in which we live, right? I, I watch too much TikTok and that just messed me up, right? Whatever it is, we love to attribute it to other people or we like to attribute it to to physical things that happen that we have no control on. So we make a disease out of everything that happens to us. So all those kind of things here we like to avoid. What, what Paul wants to begin with and say, it's not really right to describe uh, your condition as a human being as brokenness. Brokenness is speaking about the consequence of your rebellion against the God who created you. Is really, you're a rebel. Right? And you notice here is that 
there, God's wrath, his anger is extended because his, his wrath is a dimension of his love. He cannot let evil go because of its consequences. And so God extends his wrath, his disapproval, because the people are actively suppressing the truth of what they know about God. It's not that they're standing out there clueless about God's demands and his existence. They're suppressing what they know about God actively, and they're replacing the truth that they know with other truth, with other falsehood, with lies. And so as you work your way through the passage, they're rejecting God, and they're replacing it with lies. It's an act of rebellion. And so when we stand here justified, we are in a situation, right, as we've said before, one of the whole things about the biblical storyline, when Adam and Eve messed up, when they sinned against God and they, they thought that they could make it on their own and they could walk their own way, and God in his mercy did not wipe them out, but he put them outside the garden, the real question that you get from Genesis 3 forward is can they ever get back in? Can they ever get back in? Because they can't get back in because they're responsible for getting out. They're fallen, they're broken. God has to do something to make it possible for them to regain the intimacy that they lost, that they forfeited. And so to be righted with God demanded God's action in Christ to come in to do something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And the only way we get righted with God is not because God rewards us because we've been good or because we really want it, because God comes in to change our hearts and minds and he enables us to put our trust in Jesus. And by faith we say, God, do for me what I can't do for myself. God, I relinquish all my rights to this. God, I repent of my sin. God, I acknowledge that I've walked away from you and disobeyed you. I acknowledge that I deserve anything that you give me. But God, I pray, be merciful to me as a sinner. Right? That's the platform. And so one of the things that Paul wants to emphasize is that this is all an act of God to do something for undeserving people. And so this is, now what? Now we're in that, so God has righted us with him, so, so what? What's, what's the, what? What is that now? But that's the basis, okay? And so this is one of the things here, just to say off the beginning. It's very common, right, if you've been around any group of people, that when people get in trouble, God all of a sudden becomes interesting. Right? We, got, we, have, we have all kinds of things, foxhole prayers, Right? God, I'm in trouble. God, somebody else is sick. Something else is going wrong. God, please do this. Uh, and then you find people angry with God because their life is not working out well because they assume that they don't have to have any relationship with God other than they just make known to him what their needs are and he's a good God if he does for them what they want them to do. The first prayer and the only prayer that's necessary to access the grace and mercy that we're talking about here is God, deliver me. Save me. God, I have no rights to claim anything of you. And God says, I will make you a son and a daughter. Then you have access to God. Right now, God in his mercy, if you stand over against him and you've rejected Jesus, the only thing that you need, and he wants you to keep your eye on the ball, is you don't need him to fix your job. You don't need him to help your health. You don't need him right, to give you more things or more popularity. You need him. You need Jesus. That's at the beginning, right? But that's the platform to go from there. Now, the second thing here to move forward. I think I'm going to move forward. Sorry, I'm stuck. All right, here we go, right? One of the treasures we have, so let's look here. It says, we have, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So a couple things here, if you're filling out your notes that are there, is the first treasure that we find when we explore this new land of grace is peace. Okay? And peace. And the rest of the passage is really filling out what that peace is. Okay? Because we want to make sure that we understand that this peace is not an absence of wrath. It's actually the presence of blessing and favor. Okay? It's a key thing. Right? So, uh, uh, you know, there was a, a book that we read to the girls uh, when they were coming up. I think it was a British book. Uh, it was a family of hippopotamuses, I think. Um, resented any kind of similarity to us as the Kowser family. But, uh, family of hippopotamus, but the whole title of the book was Five Minutes Peace. Right? And the whole story was about a mom who was trying to get five minutes peace from her kids. Right? Uh, and she would try to, you know, lock herself in the bathroom to get a bath uh, only to have everybody pile into the bath with her. Right? 
uh, all those kind of things. She just wanted five minutes peace. I just want five minutes without screaming crazy kids. That's all I want. I just want five minutes of that, right? And so sometimes when you think of peace, you think of absence of conflict. You think of absence of, of, of active hostility that's happening, right? Sort of like the peace that would happen in my car uh, when I was growing up with my sister and uh, we, we were always fighting over, right, real estate in the back seat, right? It was very highly valued, real estate uh, in the back seat. And I was always horribly offended if, as she fell asleep, which she did every time, she would testify to that, as soon as the wheels started rolling, she would be out. And then wake up like seven hours later and say, oh, we're there already, right? Well, I was engaged the whole time, and as she would fall asleep, her body would spread out, right, over the back seat. And so I'm busy shoving, you know, feet over this direction and pushing her body over here and complaining, right, to uh, my dad and mom about the fact that she's just taking up way too much space back here, right? And my dad was a slow fuse, but when the fuse finally got lit, right, that was something you didn't want to say. It was hard because I could never really judge how close I was to a blow-up, right? That was the bad thing. Uh, but I remember, I remember them just turning around and saying, Greg, shut up. That's enough. I don't want to hear any more about Pam. Sit in your seat. You've got plenty of space. Yeah, I want some quiet. Mm, okay. Mm, 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 mm. Right? That kind of peace. Right? But this is a peace where he says your identity has been changed. You've moved from enemies to family. Right? And so it's taking off the biblical idea that's taken up in the Old Testament and carried forward in the New. The Old Testament term is shalom. The New Testament term, Irene, it's this, whole, it's this place he's brought you into a place of holistic flourishing. He's brought you into a place of favor. And that's why he says in this uh, piece, he says, through whom we have um, been given access to carry this on. Through Jesus, what he's done, we've been given access into this grace. Okay. This grace. And so grace is, is pictured like a, a land now that we get to live in, a place of favor. Right? A place of love and, and blessing. Right? Paul would say in Ephesians 1, 3, all of God's riches in Christ are now yours. You've been lavished with his favor now. You've been made a son or a daughter. He's going to flesh this out. Paul himself is going to flesh it out in Romans chapter 8 when he talks about the fact that we've been given the Spirit right, to bring us to life. We've given the Spirit as a down payment that he's going to fulfill all the promises he's given. And we've given the spirit that enables us to enjoy this relationship with God as our Father. It's by the spirit we cry out to our Father who listens to us and responds to us and loves us. Right? So we've been brought in this land of favor. And so grace is like a land that you inhabit. It's grace land. That's what you've been brought into. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've been given access. Right? And so last Sunday morning, I was working with uh, kids who are thinking about membership and baptism, and we use this little illustration, right? First and foremost, uh, as you become a part of the body of Christ, uh, you only become a part of the body of Christ to, because you are a believer in Christ. And so we talked about, uh, from Romans 6.23, a verse we're going to get to, uh, that we were estranged from God, and the wages of our sin was death. Right, Because we had separated ourselves from God and we were separated from Him. But Christ died on our behalf. He took on to Himself what we deserve and we can cross that bridge to a holy God to find the free gift of eternal life when we put our trust in Jesus and turn away from ourselves. Right? So this is the thing here. It's not just that God said, okay, shut up you guys. At least, okay, you're out of the miry pit but I don't want anything to do with you. No, you're now under my favor. Right? You're under my favor. All right, let's move on. Okay? Now he goes on beyond that. He says here, and we boast, and this is a term here, boast, probably maybe a better way to understand it is we're rejoicing in, we're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Okay? We rejoice in it. We exult in it. Okay? And so the issue here, our future is known wonderful and secure okay now this you think about this this idea here uh, there's a lot of you know when I'm in a college world uh, where I teach and a lot of people are wondering about their future okay uh, one uh, what will I do with my life okay 
I want my life to matter, uh, or I can't figure out what I should be doing. Um, I wonder, right, if, the, if that's a goal or a longing, I, you know, I wonder if I'll find a spouse, right? Will I get through Cedarville and find him or her, or will I walk out by myself on the other side? Uh, wondering about all kinds of different things that are happening, about the future, right, in, in the sense of what my life is going to uh, uh, be. But here Paul steps in and he says one of the things that is the benefit of living in the land of grace is you don't have to worry about your future. Okay, you don't have to worry about your future. You know where it's going to be. It's going to be with God. You know it's secure because God has secured it. And he's going to talk about if he saved you while you were a rebel, how much more is he going to get you to the goal if you're a son or a daughter? Right? He's going to talk about that. And so there's something here that's so important that Paul says you need to know that as you live out your life, that your future is a done deal. That is secure, that nothing can take from you the thing that you've been created for and the thing that underneath all the brokenness in your life that you long for that will satisfy every deep yearning of your soul. That is a done deal. Right? It's a key thing. Now, I put this quote up here by C.E.B. Cranfield. He's a famous commentator on the book of Romans. But when you talk about hope of the glory, a confident expectation of God's glory, what does that mean? Right? Well, he puts it this way, and we'll, we'll break it out a little bit. The illumination of man's or a person's whole being by the radiance of the divine glory, which is man's true destiny, but which was lost through sin. Okay? Let me talk about a little bit of that for Paul, right? I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8 with me for a moment. Romans chapter 8. This is a famous verse, famous section, right? Verse 28 here. And the question is, well, okay, well, can you put any more shape to that, Greg? He's going to say that we have a hope of the glory of God, right? And this is, this is talking about uh, something different. Glory can be used a lot of different ways in Scripture. It can be used to refer to God's glory, meaning kind of the, a sum total of God's excellencies, of his, of his attributes, of his beauties, right? So we talk about God's glory, right, and something we behold. It can also be used as, as like a, a verb that you give glory to God, right? You ascribe to him, you say to him, and you speak to him, and you celebrate his excellencies. You talk about those things that are his. This is talking about something that God communicates to us, right? Something that he gives us, and it's a part of his own glory that transforms us. So that we get to participate, this is another way of saying what eternal life is, right? So for Scripture, eternal life is not merely never-ending life, right? The key thing in Scripture, all human beings are never-ending. It's a very thin and accurate description to say eternal life is never-ending life. Eternal life is a transformed life. It's being brought to life. It's being restored in the image of the one who made you. It's being brought to life through the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ by the Spirit. That's this life that he's talking about. So the glory of God. And so here in Romans 8, 28, where he's wrapping up this opening section here, and he says here in verse 28, but we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who have been called according to his purpose. Because those whom he's foreknown, he predestined, and here is the glory of God in another synonymous phrase. He's destined, he's chosen to be conformed to the image of his son. So this is the interesting thing about the Christian life. It begins with recognizing that Jesus is the son of God who died in your place and did what needed to happen for you to be righted with God, and you believe on Him, okay? Your life is a process of growth to look more and more like Christ. And so the process of the Christian life is so that your desires and your life looks more and more like the desires and passions of Jesus. And then when you arrive at heaven, when you reach the goal for which God has saved you, you will be fully conformed to the image of Jesus. 
So Jesus is the beginning, middle, and end of the Christian life. Right? So that's what Paul's talking about here. That's secure. And of course, along with that means that you won't struggle with sin anymore. It means that repentance won't be a part of your vocabulary anymore. It means guilt and shame will be completely erased because all grounds for that will have been gone. It'll mean pain and suffering is gone. It means you'll be in a new body that's been completely reordered, right, so that you can enjoy the fullness of everything God created you to be. And that's secure. Okay, that's secure. That's what he wants to talk about. It's hard for us to even imagine it. I've often wondered uh, why God, in Scripture, doesn't spend uh, three or four chapters just talking about what it will like, be like to be a person in heaven. You ever think about that? And it kind of goes on the other side. I, 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 was just, I remember, I don't know when it was in my own Christian journey, but I remember reading Genesis and thinking, you know, God, I'd love for like three or four chapters on what a day in the life of Adam and Eve before they fell. I mean, what did it look like? I mean, how they talk with each other, you know, what happened, right? You know, a little, little dialogue about some, you know, vegetation that they were talking about, right? A little conversation over a meal, right? How that, what they did. Well, there's nothing. You don't get anything. You know what happened. You know how God designed them. And then you know what happens in the fall in chapter 3. And one of the things I think about that is that uh, aside from God's transforming, holistically transforming work, there'd be no way we could enter into the joy and beauty of it, this side of heaven. It would seem like something foreign. And so in the history of the church, I've talked about this here, and I think in Scripture, is that as you grow in Christ, one of the things that's happening to you, right, and we're going to talk about hope, is that you're being shaped toward the direction that you're heading. And your appetites and your desires are being more and more attached to the things that God has created you to be. And this is what the, the song, right, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim, right? There's a process, not where the earth loses its beauty, but your priorities and your passions and what you long for is different. And I think that's happening to us over the course of time. As you grow in Christ, you yearn for different things, right? So the issue here is that he's talking about is we're being shaped toward that, but that's, that future is certain, okay? But he's not just talking about the future. And this is a very intriguing part here. Well, what about the present, right? Is it just a sweet by and by so that I know the future is secure, okay? Now, I'm trying to get the idea of, of living into the security of the future. Did anybody of you see the, uh, the, the uh, Jacksonville Chargers game yesterday, right? Bring some just pagan stuff right here in the middle. Uh, Right? I don't know if you saw that or not. If you go see the clips today, at the end of the first half, you know what the score was? 27 to, was it 7 or was it 0? I can't remember. Oh, okay, well, it was, it was, they were getting crushed. And uh, the quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars had gotten intercepted four times. Right? I felt like he was more accurate to the opposing team. Right? Where's the opposing team? I'm going to hit him. Right? That kind of thing. I mean, it, it looked like an utter disaster. And if you were looking at that, right from the perspective of the game, and you are, which one of my son-in-laws is, because I like uh, the quarterback, look at that. I mean, it was pretty dire. It was dark, right? You're thinking, oh, this, they're getting killed, and the way they're playing, it's just going to get worse in the second half, right? So it's just going to get worse. Sort of like the uh, game between uh, Georgia and TCU. I mean, it got bad and bad and really bad and super bad, right? Uh, so I don't know what the end of the game was, 60-something to 7, Right, which you don't expect for you know a national uh, title game. Right, it's just an utter blowout. It's like who let the you know little kids on the field? Right, so that kind of thing happened. Right, it was demoralizing. So I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be terrible. I, I just turned the thing off. Well, I, I, I opened my phone this morning, look at it, and found out that the Jaguars won by one point. One point. Right. Now, what I want to suggest to you too, we we come to the scriptures. Sometimes you feel like you're in your life, you feel like you're in the first half playing for the Jaguars. I mean, you do, you feel like you're playing. There's a disease, there's a, a diagnosis, there's a relational difficulty, right? And you're looking at it and saying, God, what is going on? I don't feel like I'm on the winning team. 
who's winning here? Right? In the short term, things that are happening in our country and people who are in the ascendance, people who are just have lost their minds, who are even maybe even encouraging evil, dark things, they seem to be triumphing. Death of a loved one. Right? And the skirmishes and things, you're thinking, man, I feel like I'm down 27 to nothing. What's happening? And, and is the only hope to God to come back and say, okay, don't worry, you're going to win in the end. Right? But what he wants to say is that there is something about knowing that when you're in the middle of the game, that you will triumph. That none of these things ultimately will overcome. Right? And so Paul is actually going to inter allow us to just to reflect with him on that when we get to chapter 8. Right? We all know that. Well, life or death, are things present or things to come, heaven or hell, right? Any, anything height or depth, nothing will separate us from what? The love of God in Christ. Right? There's something to know that the things that really matter, that give you a purpose and a reason to go through the hard things, but never in scriptures does it say, if you've been rescued by Christ, you won't have any hard things. And it's always a lie when somebody comes on behalf of God and says, if you're faithful to God and you're serving Him, you're reading your Bible and you're going to church, then you shouldn't be sick. And you should have lots of money. And you should be popular. That's a lie. And it sets people up to be, to, to be disappointed. It sets people up to, to be crushed under life's difficulties. Right in the middle of Paul's hymn in chapter 8, he says, you give us like sheep to be slaughtered. That's a funny addition to we can trust you for life. Okay? So the issue here is he's going to say, no, it's not just that he's provided for you in the future, but he's also going, you live in this land of grace and that favor is going to keep coming to you in the midst of afflictions. Right? So it's not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Okay? Now, the point of my illustration here, right, the blue outline, is that you live in the land of grace. You live in a place of God's favor, right? I don't know if you think about this every day. God is moving toward you as a follower of Jesus to bring you to life. And his intent for every reversal, every difficulty. I was talking to Robert here. He's, he's dried off now. Every bit of applesauce on his sweater this morning. Uh, Robert was coming out of the bathroom with his sweater all wet. And uh, I think he felt compelled to describe to me that it had to do with William's applesauce and not something else that happened, right? As we're walking out through there, right? And, and they're small things and they're big things, right? And what, what God wants to say, and he doesn't describe them. Paul doesn't go into, these could be things that are, that are, that are things that come against you because you're a believer. Your family turns their back on you. You get opposition from people at work. Your peers at school think you're an idiot. There's a lot of pressure for you to give up on Jesus and adopt their lifestyle. It could be that you're just facing sickness, taking the loss of somebody that you love, just the difficulties of everyday life. Right? And so what Paul wants to say here is that you live in this land of grace. You live in this place of God's favor. And in all of these circumstances and this illustration that is, is not just a straight thing, but it's a, it's a dynamic of the Christian life. And as you go through the difficulties of a fallen, broken world, what is endurance? Endurance is looking to God for wisdom in the face of a difficulty and trusting and holding on to the truth about Him through it. Right? You're trusting Him. And as you go through pressures, right? You're, you're there as a young man, and God says, I want you to keep your sexual desires within these boundaries, and, and the world is encouraging you just to let them go wherever, and you're saying, God, no, I'll wait for you, and I'll stay in the boundaries, and I'm going to hold on, and this is hard. In a marriage, God, this is hard, and you're saying, I'm going to continue to love as you called me to love. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love this person. I'm going to get on my knees and pray for them. I'm going to hold on to you. God, I'm going to look to you, and I'm going to hold on. For a child that's walking away from Jesus, for a difficult circumstance at work, I'm not going to give in and become a vengeful person. I'm not going to gossip about other people. There's a lot of other ways I can respond, but I'm going to hold on. I'm going to look to you and trust you to walk through this. I'm going to wait. Okay? And then what happens? 
is that God will develop our character. And what I want to suggest to you, grace comes to us every one of these stages. We live in grace, and, and it just it comes after us. So God enables us, right, so that more and more we bring our passions. You think about some of the character qualities in Scripture. One of them that God wants to produce in you is self-control. What is self-control? It's keeping your passions, your priorities within God's boundaries. And so somebody attacks you, right? And God enables you not to just blurt out and give them back what they gave you. And so you respond with kindness to anger. You respond with love, right? Jesus, you love those who despitefully use you. So your character creates a different person, different patterns of life, right? So the Spirit of God is helping you to hold on. In the process of holding on, you're being trained to act differently, to behave differently, to march to a different drum. Because at the end of the day, right, tested character comes through the test, right? At the end of the day, you want to live in a way that Christ looks and says, well done, daughter. Well done, son. Right? Or as Paul would say, let God be true and every man a liar. Trust him. Well, follow him. And then it creates hope. And so here's the one that I've been thinking about this. I was talking with the elders about that. And I want to think about, well, how does that produce hope? Right? Uh, in terms of that. And here's some things I was writing down to myself as I was thinking about that. Have you come to be shaped in the image of Christ, right? This tested character. As you become more and more to love what he loves and hate what he hates. Okay? To love what he loves and hate His hope becomes more secure as you experience being transformed. Right? This gives you greater confidence in the promise that God has because you have a, a present experience of his transforming work. Right? And I've known it. You guys have known it. Um, there are sins that I love. As David would say, Lord, save me from the sins I love. Well, I have seen God dull my appetite for things that used to be compelling and give me appetites for other things. I've seen that happen. Right? I've seen that happen. I've seen God change my appetites. And that should encourage, I can trust him for his other promises. Right? I, I have prayed and had God respond in dramatic ways. Right? Not that as it always, it's not bells and whistles all the time, but I've seen God do those things. Right? I've seen him do that. Right? And so what it does, it, it secures, it makes my hope even more secure. It increases my yearning for it. Right? Second thing, my hope becomes brighter as I yearn for the fulfillment of what I've tasted. Right, so I could experience God's transforming work as he changes my heart, as he gives me new appetites, as he moves me out as a different person, right? And some of you, I can testify on your behalf, and I do it. Sometimes it happens. You, I, I know just somebody I'm thinking of right here in my mind, that God has just transformed them so that they just become a different person, and their whole family knows it. Their whole family knows it. They talk differently. They care about different things. And as you taste and see, right, you taste and see that the Lord is good, what do you want? You want more of it. I want more of it. Right, is that little commercial with the little girl. Sometimes you just want more. Right? I just want more of it. It makes me yearn for the coming of Jesus. It makes me yearn for the presence of Jesus. Right? This is the kind of thing that happens all the time at school, where I'm at right now. There are budding relationships happening all the time. Okay? And when some guy or girl tastes the goodness in a good God-honoring way. Let me make sure that's right. Taste the goodness of this new relationship that they're in. What do they want? They want more. I want to be with you more. Matter of fact, maybe I want to be with you for life. Right? That kind of thing. So your, 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 uh, your uh, hope gets brighter. And then finally, as you increasingly know freedom from the distractions and dead ends of life, right, his desire is more and more set on what God created him to be. Right? As you begin to taste God's goodness, more and more you want what God has provided for you. And you're just not happy with the knockoffs. Right? You're not happy with the knockoffs. And so it inspires hope. But I want to suggest to you, this is just a cycle. 
This is happening all the time. It's growing on itself. It's not that you go through three stages and I can say, where are you at today? Endurance or are you at approved character or hope? Well, really, you're probably at all three stages in different areas. Okay? All three stages in different areas. Okay? That's what God is doing right now. Now, finally, here, Paul ends this passage, right, in 6 through 11, and saying, you know, why do we have this confidence? Because Paul doesn't go into all the inner working. He doesn't go into how exactly all this happens here. The main thing is his burden is he wants us to trust that what God has done for us now that we're righted with him, this land of peace and grace that we live into, right? And it's a land where we know his favor, our future is secure, where we know his present provision so that we can deal with the fallenness and brokenness of this present life and we can know God's blessing, we can know his transforming work, right? What, what's, the, what's the ground of all of that? Why, why can't we trust it? And here it's just at the end, it's just a comparison and an expose of the love of God in Christ. Now, I often say this, you know, in the darkest moments of life, hospital rooms, abandonment, abuse. We live in a moment as Christians where we're finite, we're limited, we don't have a full view of everything. We don't know why certain things happen. The only thing we do know is that we do know the one who knows why. And the, the way to get your perspective right on the one who knows why is that in the darkest moments, you need to go back and set at the foot of the cross. If you ever doubt God's love for you, the cross is the measure of God's love. If you ever doubt the idea that he is with you in suffering, the cross tells you that he did not abandon us, but he entered the deepest, darkest suffering on our behalf. If you ever doubt that God is willing to go to the nth degree to deliver you when you're at your most stupid self, there's the cross. And sometimes that's all you have. You just need to go in your mind and sit at the foot of the, G of the cross and ask God by his spirit to open your eyes of your heart to see the wonder of Christ's love. And so, this is one of my favorite verses. Many people know this one, right? This, the passage here, and look at it with me here, where Paul builds, right? He's comparing it to any kind of thing, that the kind of love that you see in Jesus is supernatural. It's unheard of. It's unparalleled. There's no comparison. And he uses the two examples of, of people that you might think that someone would die for. A righteous person, right? The person who, who, who does the, everything right. He says, ah, oh, it's unlikely that anybody's going to die just for a righteous person. Matter of fact, in a fallen, broken world, people who always present themselves as righteous aren't very liked. Okay? But maybe for a good person, right, somebody who's genuinely a good person, someone might dare to die. But who on earth dies for their enemies? And the idea is the enemies, and this is the key thing, the enemies were not were not calling out for Christ to die for them. They didn't understand that they were sinking beneath the waves. They didn't understand the dire situation that they were in. And yet, while they were still, what? Sinners. Christ died for them. While they were in active rebellion against him, while they were repudiating him, hating him, walking their own way, giving them the Heisman and saying, God, I can do everything on my own. No, thank you or I'll call you when I need your help. That's when Christ died. And it's not, right, as you look at it, it's not just that he died on the cross. This is, this is the thing that we need help. It's Christ that died. It's the Son of God. He died. He died for you. Amen. You know, when we take the communion, right, this is my body, which is for you. It takes us back into that moment time and time again because we need to know that. Now, here's the other side. Paul makes a how much more argument. This is very care. Jesus makes these arguments all the time, right? One of Jesus' famous ones is, 
You know, if your earthly fathers gives good gifts to you, sons and daughters, how much more will your heavenly father do that? Luke chapter 11, if you want to look that up, right? Well, this is Paul's. If when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Right? Now, Paul's, Paul could never get over this in his own life, and he's going to come back to it over and over again through the book of Romans. If he's now that you're sons and daughters, now that he's made you sons and daughters, how much more, now that he took rebels and made them sons and daughters, how much more is he going to take you to the goal for which he saved you? Right? All right, here's my reflections at the end. Okay, I'm going to ask the, the team to come up uh, and sing here. And I want to say real quickly here uh, through these, uh, as we come into our final song here. So Alan's moving by faith right here. So he's saying, okay, we'll come. Now I'm using a, I'm using a phrase, my wife would probably be mad at me to use the word trope, okay? So I defined it here, okay? Treasure or trope. Trope is a common or overused theme or device, a cliche. I needed a T, that's why I used trope, right? Um, but the idea is, you know, for many of us, um, I say this in my classes a lot, we're used to speaking Christian mumbo jumbo. And I mean, we can speak these phrases among each other, but they don't, they don't rock us, they don't, they don't impact us. And because we wrestle against the fallen, broken world to hold on to the richness and goodness of what God has done for us in Christ. Our hearts grow cold. Even Jesus says, right, you read of Jesus, he says that in the last days, in this period of time, one of the characteristics of people is that their, their love of many will go cold. Right? And so... The issue here is, is it can become just something that you, ma- but it th- somehow doesn't penetrate your anxieties. It doesn't penetrate your addictions. It doesn't penetrate your practices. And this is where we need God's help to make it a living treasure, right? And so, are you a rebel or a family member? That's the first question. Two, are you a rebel or a family member? Have you come to embrace Christ as your Savior? Are you resting or are you fretting? Your hope is secure. Everything that you long for. I don't care if you feel like you're in the second quarters and you're playing for the Jaguars. I don't care. Your hope is secure. Are you waiting on God-approved character or are you running ahead and away? Right? One of my favorite songs, Shane and Shane, I think it's Psalm, is it 130 or 30? I can't remember now. 130. Psalm 130 is the phrase that they sing over again. I will wait for you. I will wait. I will wait in the midst of my suffering. I'm not going to bolt from you. I'm going to wait. In this struggle with temptation, God, I'm going to wait. In this longing for my partner or my friend, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm waiting for you, God, here. And then, last one, are you basking? in the delight of being loved by Christ or are you bored? Sing for us and then we'll...